Okay, this is the third video in the first section on calculus, and today I'm going to introduce a concept which I think will be new for most people, uh, which is called partial differentiation. And so, what is partial differentiation? Well, this is about differentiating functions of two or possibly more than two variables. And so we're quite accustomed to thinking about functions of a single variable and their graphs. Uh, but in many applications, of course, we have a quantity that can depend on more than one variable. And so we can think of simple examples of a function of two variables. Um, we just combine functions that you know of one variable together. For example, this one that's shown, x squared minus x times cosine of y times cosine of y. Nothing special about that function, just an example of something that depends on two variables, the variables here being x and y. Um, here's a, another reasonably straightforward example, just a function now of two variables where the variables are u and w. Uh, I give an example that, come, that might come up in an application. You can have the ideal gas law where we think of pressure as a function of volume and temperature. In some cases you might want to think of volume or temperature as a function of the other two, but you think of pressure, P, as a function of volume and temperature, uh, then we get this equation. So pressure is RT over V. And uh, this R is just a constant, which is bringing together some physical factors. And the way it depends on T and V, simply be multiply times T and divide by V. So in a, when we have a partial derivative, what we do is we fix one of the two variables or if there's more than two variables, you fix all of the variables except for one, and then you differentiate with respect to that one variable. And so, for example, if we have this function, f of x and y is x squared plus x times sine of y, when we take the partial derivative with respect to x, you think of y as a constant, as being fixed, and then you take the derivative only with respect to x, where you view y as being a constant. And so in this example, the partial derivative of f with respect to x would be 2x plus sine of y. So the 2x comes from taking the derivative of x squared with respect to x, and then the sine of y comes from taking the derivative of this second term with respect to x. And so sine of y would just be constant, so it's a constant times x, and when you take the derivative of that, you get sine of y. So sometimes when people first encounter this, they get confused with the uh, what's called implicit differentiation, where you have uh, some sort of formula, like a function of two variables like this, that's set equal to a constant, and then you take the derivative and you assume that that formula is implicitly defining y as a function of x, and you try to calculate the de derivative of y with respect to x in that way. But this is a different thing, different from this implicit differentiation. You just think of y as a constant when you're doing partial derivatives. Uh, so you can, of course, also take the derivative with respect to y, and in which case you hold x constant. And so you vary y, but treat x as a constant, and you get then the partial derivative of the function f with respect to y. And in this case, that would be x times cosine of y. That's because the first term here, x squared, does not depend on y. So when you take the derivative with respect to y, holding x constant, you get 0. And the second term, you take the derivative with respect to y, the derivative of sine of y is cosine of y. So that leaves this expression x times cosine of y. And so I want to, this is a basic idea of partial derivatives. I want to try to draw a picture to kind of illustrate a bit what's going on. I want to try to visualize what a function looks like in three dimensions. And so we have a function of two variables. And we think of the function as giving us the height above the xy plane when the variables are x and y. So I'll try to draw these uh, three-dimensional axes. So uh, this span of these two axes is going to be the xy plane. This will be x and this will be y. And then coming up, making a height above the xy plane is the z-axis. And so when we have a function, of two variables, we think of uh, the graph, it will be the set where z equals f of x and y. And we think of 
f at a given point x and y is giving the height above the uh, x y planks. Okay, and so uh, let's consider this function defined for x and y in a given rectangle in the x y plane. So take a rectangle, try to make its sides parallel with the axes. So this is the set in the xy plane where the function is defined. And then at each point, x and y, so let's say we have a given x and y, and then point corresponding well, with coordinates given by x and y in the xy plane. And then the graph of the function of two variables is the height above the xy plane. So coming up here. And this height here is f at that point x and y. And if we then graph it at all the different points inside this rectangle, what you would get is you have like a, a solid block with a curved top, the height of the block corresponding at each point to the function f. So in this corner it might be like this. In this corner it's like this, and then there would be a curve going along that edge. And that would be some other height at the other corners. Trying to draw these curved to emphasize that the top of this would be some kind of curved surface. And yeah, this would be one particular point on the surface. And now, okay, so this is the graph of a function of two variables. And now if we want to fix one of the variables, what we're gonna do is take a slice of this a solid block with the curved top. So let's say we fix y, and when y is fixed, x varies, we move along this line in the xy plane, and so we would then have a slice of this block, and so it might look like something like this, kind of making up what the top of the block looks like, but the heights here are the, the function f, and so if you fix y and move, change x, the graph, you move along the graph along this curve. And if you take the partial derivative of f with respect to x, that's fixing y and varying x, you would get the slope of the tangent line to this graph at any given point. So you take the tangent line to this graph in the slice, and you would get the slope of that. Right? And if we want to consider what happens when we fix x and vary y, we get a slice in the other direction. So if we fix x, we just along this line here, and uh, the values of the function go along the, the top block, slice of the block, and you'd have a place that might look like this. And so uh, we can slice it either this way, parallel to the uh, x-axis when we're varying x, or this way, parallel to the y-axis when we're varying y. Take the partial derivative with respect to y, we would get the tangent line to this curve when we vary y. So this is a kind of geometric visualization of what the partial derivatives are and what the graph of a function of two variables would look like. It's useful to have these kind of pictures in mind sometimes, I think. Okay, so one one comment about the notation is that uh, we use this uh, round or curly d when we're talking about partial derivatives. And this is very important to distinguish it from the regular derivative where we just use a normal d. So in the partial derivative that we use this curly uh, notation to indicate that all the other variables are held constant and we just differentiate with respect to one of the variables. All right, so as an example, let's suppose we go back to this uh, example I gave of the ideal gas law. The pressure is a constant R times T divided by V. And maybe we want to find the rate of change of the pressure as the temperature varies at a constant volume. So you, you then hold V constant and you take the derivative with respect to T. And this is the partial derivative dP dt. And when you take the derivative of this expression with respect to t, with v treated as a constant, you just get 
r divided by v because it's simply a linear function of t. All right, we could also think about what happens when the temperature is held constant, but the volume is varied. What happens to the pressure then? And this would be the partial derivative of the pressure with respect to the volume. The temperature is held constant and the volume has changed. And when you take the derivative with respect to the volume, you can get negative RT divided by V squared. It would be the partial derivative of P with respect to V. And here is another example. <coughs> and there's actually something else new that's been introduced in this example you may not have seen before, which is this function COSH is the hyperbolic cosine function, cosh function sometimes called. And uh, it's defined uh, in this way. The hyperbolic cosine is of y, function y is, or the coordinate y, is e to the y plus e to the negative y divided by 2. And uh, there's a reason this is related to the regular cosine function. Once we study complex numbers, you'll see more uh, clearly why it's natural to call this the hyperbolic cosine. But this is the definition of the function. And there is correspondingly a hyperbolic sine, which is some kind, it's called the shine function. Or if you're in the United States, like where I come from, the cinch function. But uh, I think here it's normally shine. Uh, and the definition of the hyperbolic sine is e to the y minus e to the negative y divided by 2. And then you can calculate the derivatives of the hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine fairly easily. And just because you know what the derivative of e to the y is, and for e to the negative y, you have to use the chain rule. But the derivative of e to the negative y, with respect to y, is negative e to the negative y. Because of this, when you take the derivative of hyperbolic cosine, you get hyperbolic sine. And when you take the derivative of hyperbolic sine, you get hyperbolic cosine. So it's a lot like the sine and cosine functions. It's just there's no negative sign here when you take the derivative of the hyperbolic cosine. Okay. So we can still take the partial derivatives of this function of x and y. We just have to know the definition of the, this hyperbolic cosine. So say we take the derivative df dx. This is the derivative where we hold y constant. So that means the entire part of the expression, which is y, hyperbolic cosine of y, is a constant. And you simply take the derivative of the x squared, and that gives 2x. So this df dx. 2xy, hyperbolic cosine of y. And similarly, you can take the partial derivative with respect to y, and you hold x constant, so the x squared is a constant, and then you have to apply the product rule in order to take the derivative of y times the hyperbolic cosine of y. So the x squared is just there in, in both the terms, and then the two terms come from applying the product rule. So the first term comes from when we take the derivative of y, which is just 1, times the other term, hyperbolic cosine. And the other term comes from taking the derivative of the hyperbolic cosine, which is the hyperbolic sine. OK, um, so this is uh, partial derivatives. We can also take higher order partial derivatives. And the idea here is just the same as taking higher order derivatives. You take a first derivative, and then if you take the derivative of the first derivative, that's the second derivative, and so on. And with partial derivatives, you can take a partial derivative with respect to one of the variables, and then take another partial derivative of that function with respect to one of the variables, and these are the higher order partial derivatives. And so, for example, if you have a function of x and y, you can take the second order derivative, second order partial derivative with respect to x, and that's what we get when we take the first order partial derivative and then take the derivative with respect to x a second time. And we can do the same thing with y. And then uh, we have a, a additional terms. Oh, sorry. The, there's a notation that's associated with this that's oftentimes used, which is that uh, we put subscripts for the derivatives. So when we take the derivative with respect to x two times, we put f with two subscripts x. And if we wanted to take it another time, you put another x in the subscript, and the same with y. Uh, unlike when there's only one variable, we can have mixed partial derivatives, where we take derivatives with respect to both of the variables. And so you can, for example, have second derivative with respect to x and y. 
So you take the derivative, this is what we get when we take the derivative of f with respect to y, and then take the derivative with respect to x. And you could also do it in the other order. So you take, we've switched x and y in the denominator here, so you first take the derivative of f with respect to x, and then take the derivative with respect to y. And uh, we also use the subscript notation for these mixed partial derivatives. So this f with the subscript yx is when you take the derivative first with respect to y and then with respect to x. Maybe a bit confusing to remember which order that is. But you think of it, the ones that are closest to x are done first. And then the other way is that you take the derivative with respect to x first and then with respect to y. So yeah, it is a bit confusing to think of what the order is, but actually, as it turns out, the order will not matter. And so it, you don't actually have to remember which order it goes in. You don't know that when you first introduce this concept of second order partial derivatives. But in fact, whichever order you do the derivatives in, you'll get the same result. Well, I'm not, we're not going to prove that, but we'll look at an example at least where you can see that it's true. And the, the same kind of notation holds for third or higher order derivatives. So you can use uh, either this, this kind of notation or the notation with the subscripts to indicate third and higher. You simply add further subscripts when you take additional derivatives. Okay, um, just as a, a note for applications, maybe you think where, where would this possibly be used? The uh, equation which describes how a beam flexes, so if you have a, a solid beam and how it, it moves elastically, um, that involves fourth order partial derivatives. So these, these are something that actually come up in modeling uh, real world situations. Okay, so here, as an example, let's calculate all of the second order partial derivatives of this function of two variables, x and y. So do this by hand. All right, so we have this function. x squared plus xy cubed minus y squared. And so let's first calculate the first order derivatives, of course. So in order to calculate the second order derivatives, you need to calculate the first order derivatives. So first, calculate the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And that can be denoted using either of these notations. And so we can differentiate this function with respect to x. The first term you get 2x. The second term you get uh, x, or sorry, y cubed. And then the third term you would differentiate that with respect to x, and y doesn't depend on x, y is held constant, so that would be 0. So now let's take the partial derivative with respect to y. So the, this term, well, the first term only depends on x. So when you take the derivative with respect to y, you get zero. The second term, you get three x y squared, and then the third term, you get minus two y. Okay, these are the first order partial derivatives. Now let's calculate the second order partial derivatives. So let's first calculate uh, f x x. So this is when we take another derivative of f x with respect to x. Also given by this notation. So you look at the formula for the f dx, and so maybe to be more clear, this is the derivative with respect to x of the f dx. So we already have a first order partial derivative. You take the derivative again with respect to x, you just get two. So you take the derivative of this first term with respect to x, you get two. The second term does not depend on x. And then let's also calculate second order partial with respect to y. So we use the either of these notations, f with two y's in the subscript, or d squared f dy squared, sorry, forgot that square. And so to be clear, this is what we get when we take the derivative with respect to y of 
dfdy. Now here's a dfdy. Take the derivative with respect to y. First term you get 6xy. Second term you get minus 2. All right, now we also have the mixed partial derivatives, fxy and fyx, and as I said, those are the same, but for this example, we'll calculate them both separately. You'll see that they, they're the same. So fxy, so remember I said, this is where we take the derivative with respect to x first and then y. Write this as this way, and this is derivative with respect to y of the f x <coughs> okay here's df dx take the derivative with respect to y you get 3y squared this first term doesn't depend on y 3y squared then you do it the other way f y x the second derivative of f dx y this is where we take the derivative with respect to x of df dy here's df dy you take the derivative with respect to x this first term you get 3y squared the second term you get 0 because the y is a, is a constant so 3y squared <coughs> and you can see in fact these two mixed partial derivatives are the same and this is in fact a general thing for all functions uh, as long as they're differentiable, as long as you can take the derivatives everywhere, the mixed partial derivatives will be the same. Right. So yes, this is also just a stress here that these mixed partial derivatives are equal in this case, and in fact, that's always going to be true. So you don't have to calculate both of them. You can only cal calculate one or the other. OK, uh, just as one more example, of partial derivatives, we'll uh, find a function f of this given form. So f is a times x squared plus b times y squared. a and b are constants. They don't depend on x and y. <coughs> and we want to choose the constants a and b so that f satisfies this differential equation. So this is a differential equation. It's relating partial derivatives of f. In fact, it's a partial differential equation. This differential equation is quite important in many applications. Uh, the fxx plus fyy is called the Laplacian of f. Uh, and functions that satisfy this equation can be static heat distributions. Uh, in three dimensions, it can correspond with uh, electrical potentials. Uh, the electrical potential will satisfy this corresponding equation in three dimensions. And so uh, this equation with this Laplacian is, is actually quite an important one in applications. But here, just giving a very simple example. All right, so we have the function. We assume it has this particular form, constant times x squared plus the constant times y squared. And we want to calculate the Laplacian of that function and set it equal to 0 and see what, what that implies about a and b. So let's take the partial derivatives. First, the first partial derivative with respect to x is 2ax. And the second partial derivative with respect to x, take the derivative of this one, with respect to x, you get 2a. Okay, then we do the same thing with respect to y, and actually it's a metric with respect to x and y where you change a and b. So we just get uh, 2by for the first partial derivative with respect to y. And to b the second partial derivative. And the equation we will, we're hoping to satisfy is xx plus f y y equals zero. We put in what we've just calculated for these partial derivatives. That is 2a plus 2b equals zero. And that's going to be true if and only if a is equal to negative b. Okay, so this function f satisfies the given equation, partial differential equation, if and only if a is equal to negative b. So for example, if it's x squared minus y squared, it satisfies the equation. 
Okay. So uh, that's the end of the first video about partial differential, or sorry, partial derivatives. Uh, we're going to go on and in the next video and look at the how we can, well, what the chain rule is for partial derivatives. And then following that, we'll look at an application of partial derivatives to estimating the sizes of error.